Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. What's the RPG day? For RPG A Day 2023, it is the weirdest game you've played. Weird? Oh, my God. <sighs> That's a hard one, because y'all are a bunch of weirdos. Right? Yeah. <laughs> It's a weird definition. Weird. weird. So, um, in terms of weirdness, it would have to be either Nobilis or Paranoia. <laughs> paranoia. Paranoia. <laughs> uh, how do you die that. seven times in the first hour? Sometimes you die during character creation. Right? Yep. Right? See, see, Kelly, I have not subjected you to Paranoia because it's one of those games where your character will be like the eighth clone of yourself. Yeah. Because people will kill each other, the environment will kill each other, the light blinking Morse code that anyone not reading this message is a spy will kill everybody. Well, it'll kill you because it was blinking in green and you were red. Right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that it's been so long since I played that one. That is... Basically, think of it this way, Kelly. Paranoia is a game that the setting is basically Orson Welles' worst nightmare, <laughs> where the state is running everything, and every faction has its own tinfoil hat conspiracy. No, yeah, I don't think I could... Uh... That would just and, it's, and you may just the hell out of me. And you may all just be janitors no. that are supposed to clean a hallway, not cross a line. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh like the 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 newest edition. I'm pretty sure is is ultraviolet. I think I have it, but uh <laughs> you it, it's effectively you live in. Do you do you ever play the game Portal with ladders? Uh, no. But she knows of yeah. Portal. Uh, and I can you, see the song. <laughs> yeah, you live in a in a giant underground complex, uh, and you you work as a troubleshooter for the Glados type supercomputer, uh, which means that you find trouble and shoot it. Uh, hmm. And for the and as part of being a good citizen to this computer, you <laughs> uh, hate all forms of mutants and secret societies. Which means that every single character is, of course, a member of a secret society and is a mutant. Um, yeah. and, and these are secret societies that are wonderful. Like, uh, if I remember correctly, the communists are based on the writings of Groucho Marx. You know, that famous <laughs> writer. Uh, the wrong Marx brother. Yeah, not, not <laughs> actual Marxism, but... <laughs> It's it's fun. It, it, it's it's ridiculous. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's totally a drinking. Yeah, game. There's, it's not there's, a long term campaign. It's like well, one you can like, like that, there's a there's a few different ways you can play it. You can play it straight, which is terrifying. You know, it is it is it is the uh, sci fi nightmare future, or you can play it like mm-hmm. the slapstick that it was originally envisioned as. Yeah. Yeah, if you play it serious, it is the Orson Welles nightmare. Because, of course, everyone is a cloned mutant of what they originally were, so you hate yourself regardless. Yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. It Yeah, that would be probably one of the weirdest. I, I kind of agree on that one. Paranoia is wackadoodle nuts when you play it. And the thing is, 
as a GM, you have to be careful to really be on the ball. Because if you're distracted at any point, you can totally miss people doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it'd be like, wait a minute, did you say blah, blah, blah? And it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And you're like, damn it. I missed it. Grr, I could have killed you. Right. Uh, anything you do is a likely is, chance that you'll get killed player. and reincarnated. <laughs> New clone. Yep. So, see, Kelly, as soon as you die, basically your body gets disposed of, and a little laundry chute opens up and your clone slithers out. <laughs> yeah. Almost like Venture Brothers. You know how when the boys would die, they'd have clones ready and waiting? Uh huh. That's totally paranoia. So, as soon as you die, you're immediately replaced by your next clone. Yeah. Who's going to be a little more wrong? <laughs> Which then, of course, creates this death spiral as you guys die and reincarnate and come back a little more wrong each time. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, just... each clone is a bad photocopy of a bad fax. Yeah. I'm trying to think something else. I mean, Numenera, kind of, but it's not really weird. Just, but. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The w rules are kind of weird to me. It's like. A little too unstructured. What, Numenera? Yeah. Yeah, I, I like, kind of like, well, you got a structure. Your character creation is really simple. You come up with the terms to describe them, and that's you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a blank, blank, who blanks, but then I have to be a mathematician. <laughs> See, Kelly doesn't like math, and we know Numenera is very crunchy with the math. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. I mean, I can, I totally see where Cook was coming up with with his math for that because it does kind of blend Savage Worlds mechanics with D twenty systems mechanics, and the whole effort is fun in my opinion because it proves that I'm spending a metric to make it easier, right? And I spend my speed to do it to downgrade the target number. But then again, it goes back to the Thaco days where you need a uh, chart right. to track of what the number is. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely Though a little I will more totally crunchy on that. Say, I will definitely say as a GM, it's great because you don't roll any dice. Right. And you just wait for somebody to roll bad and say, GM intrusion time. <laughs> you didn't suck, but here's something interesting that happens. Yeah. Have you done Numenera By at the all, way, Eric? here's some experience. I'm sorry, my face is full of vegetables. Uh, <laughs> oh my god, someone save him from the vegetables. No, I, I, I haven't played vegetables. that one. I'm completely unfamiliar with it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's really weird. It's it's kind of, you know, your... Um, oh, what was it? You know, it's like... Your... Well, well, let's start with the, the setting. It's the ninth generation of the Earth. Mm -hmm. So nine civilizations have... Well, eight civilizations have come and gone and been wiped off the Earth. And you are on the ninth life cycle of Earth. So, of course, it's now a hodgepodge of everything left over brought to the present. So you have your modern, you know, what could be classified as human, doesn't realize where a lot of stuff actually is that used to exist, you know. You totally have that Ariel the Mermaid thing pulling out the farfel dinger and trying to explain what this thing is, and it's really just a fork. The dinglehopper. The dinglehopper. <laughs> and of course you've got uh, superpower type people you've got technology, psychic people think of anything you could have seen in the Planet of the Apes TV show that's totally a Numenera and when you come up with your character you are a blank blank who blanks Right. so you could say I am a clever so I have some powers from being clever glaive which means I use a big two handed weapon who's covered in ice. Mm -hmm. So I have Iceman powers on top of it. And you put all three of those together, and those are your abilities. When it comes to stats, you have three stats. You've got uh, yeah, I don't strength, yeah. frowness, no, strength, mental, and speed. And you can spend, the different character builds can spend those points as hit points or as the ability to reduce the target number to do something. So when you do it, everything is a static number. So if you're like fighting, say, a high-level monster, you got to roll a 17 or higher to hit the monster or avoid the monster's attacks. So when it swings at you, you have to dodge. 
Well, if you're using speed, you can actually donate one of your speed hit points to drop that 17 down to a 13. It's an increment, I, I think four is the, the increment. Yeah, it's some weird, yeah, again, yeah, yeah crunchy, Yeah, basically weird. you can spend your hit points to make it easier to accomplish. Yep. Now, each build, like you've got your glaive, you've got your jack-of-all-trades, you've got your speedster type thing, each one of them are good at one of those three categories of speed, mental, or strength. And they reduce the cost of spending those points. So instead of spending two, you could, you'd could only be spending one per time you do this. Because it shows that you have a reserve of that. Yeah. But the problem is that's your hit points as well as your economy to spend like fate points. So you can choose to drop yourself out. And it just takes time to build those those numbers back up. And then the cool part of the game is you have your Numenera which is magic MacGuffin stuff that we don't know what it really is in real life. Yeah. But in the game, this is the cool meta magic thing that it can be because the technology is so uber, it appears as if magic. So it could totally be you, you've got a, a uh, condenser and it's basically full of Freon and you're pulling a plug and throwing it at something. Well, in game, the Numenera is a frost bomb right. that slows down your targets, you know, and, some... and you can only have so many Numenera. So or you're overloaded. You them. Yeah. Or the new worse, the Numenera start combining themselves into something new. Yeah. Some are like one time use weird functions. Some are more permanent type function and can be kept longer. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. pretty wild. Yeah, it's like, oh, you find a thing that kind of looks like a pen, and then you're trying to figure out, okay, what is this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it has some weird effect that you might not expect. <laughs> yeah, it's basically like Gamma World dialed up to a 10. Yeah. Because the whole idea is, as the GM, you're supposed to be describing these things as vague as possible. So even if you're describing something as simple as a red wagon, you want to vague it out so the players are still guessing at what this contraption is. Which which is fun. I mean, it really is. Because then you, you're basically describing something really mundane and simple, but to these adventurers who don't understand what this is, it's amazing. Yeah. But literally, the character, yeah, the creation is literally, uh, I'm a blank that blank that, you know, blanks. It's like, oh, okay, that's the yep. whole creation of your character. <laughs> it's like pretty And pr basic. pretty much for uh, The Strange, which is, 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 I like The Strange better than Numenera myself. Because The Strange is totally Stargate with the same game mechanics. Oh, really? Yeah, and with the strange is you most players are going to be like your Stargate crew that you have a either a portal that your company owns or that you guys can transcend mentally by meditating together to different realms. Mm. And the cool thing with that one is you can say I am a clever archer who thinks well in a pinch. And when you transport to say pyramid Egypt world you now get to change that third aspect of yourself to something local on the new planet mm. because you basically get to adapt to the world. So your characters are technically changing every couple of levels when you go to these different places. That's cool. I hadn't seen that one. And you can have recursions is what they call the other dimensions of anything. So there's totally like the Alice in Wonderland recursion because enough people have thought about that, that the collective psyches have created a recursion of that. There's totally the Dr. Moriarty's uh, steampunk world. Hmm. Where it's Dr. Moriarty and all of his steampunk contraptions. And of course, the bunch of the fluff books they have, there's like one book that's got like 80 different ink recursions. Because since you're describing them so vague, it's super easy to stat things out. Okay. That's cool. But I think Paranoia still kind of hits the number one. <laughs> yeah, paranoia. Paranoia hits the weirdest one there. What do you got for weirdest, Kelly? Um, that is a good question. A good question. I mean, <laughs> I, the funny thing is, is like that a board game is coming to my head, mm. not an RPG, 
but uh, um, the weirdest. I mean, Numenera, yeah. Um, nah, I got nothing. All I can think of is that horrible. Uh, yeah, yeah, weird's uh, one of those odd categories. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, the Numenera is pretty weird. Very nice, um, definitely be a drinking me, game. It, it totally <laughs> embraces its, its weirdness. That's totally the, the literally in the bylines from the the creator. He's like embrace the weird, you know, embrace yeah. the Numenera in it. Yeah. And I, yeah. So I would have to to go with that one as well. Okay. See, I will totally throw it out there. The what, like sixth, seventh edition of Gamma World. No. Yeah. Oh, well. That was the one where where Dean where Wizards of the Coast tried reinventing it. Yeah, it's, and okay. you literally pulled two cards from a deck, and you were a blank and blank. So it's like you are a automaton and an ice monster. I kind of prefer because the they made original curious. way. Yeah, yeah, the actual rolling. I mean, right. and, stuff, and you could get some of the craziest combinations. Like, uh, I think it was my sister or something. She had a. Uh, uh, rolled an owl. That was pretty was, harsh. Yeah, who was afraid of the dark? <laughs> a mutated owl afraid of the. It's an owl. <laughs> it's <so laughs> That's metal. awesome. And it's afraid of the dark. I mean, we got quite the kick out of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just gotta say, why wouldn't they be afraid of the dark? They know the shit that's out there. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but being afraid of the dark itself. <laughs> yeah, well, when that's your hunting time and everything else, and yeah, yeah that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I was the, if I was an Arizona desert owl, I'd be terrified of the dark. <laughs> All the other bigger owls are out there. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so I like the original one. Uh, it was, you know, mm-hmm. it was a lot more crunchy on certain things, um, but... Uh, it kind of gave you a little more. It didn't pigeonhole you as much, I think, as the. Yeah, you could still do your apocalyptic game without being wrecked. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think. Uh... Like, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Mutant Year Zero, but one of the problems is as you play that game and your character keeps mutating and basically growing weaker and weaker and weaker. Oh, yeah. Mutates, Mutant Year Zero is weird in that the random mutations happen, but the problem is as you get more powerful in the mutations, you literally are dying just to get more powerful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm still kind of hung up on the owl now. That would be... <laughs> well, no, because, I mean, that would be rough. They don't know. So when I was at my cousin's out, out by... Um, she lives out in Vale, and... She has like a little ground pond, little area. And I looked out there one day and there's this huge great horned owl middle of the day sitting there drinking out of the water surrounded by like quail and dove. Oh, my God. And the quail and the <laughs> dove were fine with this? Well, they didn't. They don't interact with them because they bed down at night. So they don't yeah, deal they, with an they owl. They hunker down. And the owl apparently didn't know any better because, you know, he's a nighttime creator for hunting. So none of these are hunting critters that they normally look for. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, You're not a field mouse or a little bat. Right. So I'm like, oh, that's really weird. (laughs) Like they don't. The lion and the lamb are laying down together. Yeah. It's like they don't know to be afraid of him and he's like well i don't know is this food i don't know i just i'm here for water because <laughs> my food's out at night and run around the ground and because <laughs> it's hella hot out there yeah so that was it was really cool i was just like wow though uh i will throw one last one out there for weirdest game oh totally a certain tentacle ethermancer in our Genesis oh. steampunk-ish game that went weird. That sounds so normal. <laughs> <laughs> but also charming and intelligent. Yeah. It's like, wait, how are you going to make this sound weird? <laughs> well, 
it, it sounded weirder the other day on, on our salvage game when, when Joseph was describing some of the actions that the group took back in the day. Right. Of course, starting with him crippling children. Oh, nice. That was when he played his shapeshifter. And the fact that we both immediately said, ah, but our Aether Master could have totally given the kids tentacles. <laughs> I'm surprised yeah, he didn't bring up the, the whole weird WrestleMania cannon ship da, da, thing. Da, da. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he never brought that up. <laughs> I think we're still traumatized and trying to block that out. Yeah. <laughs> Victorian steampunk post, you know, war John Cena in the fighting ring. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, they even did the da-da-da-da. Uh, jeez. I, I totally blame it because it was a Friday night game, and after you're exhausted at work, you have to vent on a Friday night. Right. And let whatever insanity crawls out of your brain happen. Right. Well, uh, yeah, the... And the likelihood of the uh, alcohol flowing might be a little higher. Because <laughs> no work the next you know, day. I think, I think only once did we ever, back when we came to the store, bring booze in. Well, you legally, technically weren't able to before the alcohol. But I know, like, if you mm -hmm. gained with Mark or, you know, you um we're oh, just yeah. discreet about it, then yes, it did happen. People, you know, brought stuff it, in, but there was the one time I brought in dinner for us, and I'm pretty sure I brought a couple bottles of wine that mysteriously disappeared. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that was one of the times I was referring to. Yeah. Well, the food so. was amazing. <laughs> I don't know about the wine, <laughs> but the food was wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. He he knew there was some of that going along as long as you like you know, if we had like one of the epic games where we were, you know, playing for like 12 hours or what, um, yeah, we had kind of in the back and you kind of went and, and discreetly in the back room and poured it. And but oh, I, I, I observed a few of those that it wasn't discreet. Yes. Well, of course, that was also when somebody was, was dealing with some issues. So. Right. Oh, well, yeah, there's yeah. A particular individual that yeah wasn't so discreet, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, but but now there's a bar in the back of the game store, and that's awesome for everybody. What is? And yeah, that's now he can't allow that because then that puts the license at risk. Yep. So I definitely think that wraps up weirdest game you've played. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.